Although it's an unfortunate reality that not everyone enjoys the holiday season, for a variety of reasons, what should be a time of joy is for many a time of sorrow and stress and anxiety. But there is help available in this week's in-depth segment. Susan Cadell moderates a discussion on how to cope with holiday depression. That's right, Rich. We are going to be talking about how to cope through the magical and sometimes stressful holiday season that we are all in right now. I'd like to introduce our guest to you. We have a Megan Cannon, who is the Suicide Prevention Program Manager with the Oklahoma Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. Did I get that right? You did. We said that was a long <laughs> title. And then we have Jeff Dismukes, who is the um, PIO with the Oklahoma Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. So you guys know each other really well. Very well. Yeah, Quite well. We were having a talk before, and I do want to put a stat out there on our discussion. You know, there are first there are folks that really suffer with acute depression and anxiety, and then there are those who maybe don't, but they feel the anxiety and the pressures that this time of year brings. Um, the American Psychological Association found that 38 percent of people do feel increased stress during the holidays. And Jeff, I was telling you that seems low. Yeah, well, I think a lot of people feel stress in in mm -hmm. the holidays, and. And, and it manifests itself differently. Uh, there are pressures that we have. You know, we were we were talking before this, and um, I watched the movie Christmas Vacation this this last week. And it's funny because of how true it is. And it's that pursuit of the perfect holiday, uh, mm -hmm. the pursuit of everything that's right for everybody else. You worry about everybody else. You're trying to to meet whatever ideal it is. Just really ramps up that pressure, uh, whether it's from decorating the house to buying presents for the kids to just getting family together. You know, mm. We're really pulled in many different directions this time of year. Right. We were talking about, Megan, you know, it really is just, just on a normal scale. And we're going to get to the more serious issues that folks do face, especially that kind of are amplified this time of year. But, you know, is there is it serious to learn how to cope with all of the pressure someone feels during the holidays? It's absolutely important to learn how to cope with that. Sometimes you have to take a step back and say, OK, well, the neighbor's house is beautifully lit up, it's professionally done, it's set to music. It's okay if I just put up some, some inflatables this year or maybe if I just have my tree in the window or lights in the window, a menorah in the window. You don't have to be perfect because mm -hmm. the truth is none of us are. Yes, yes. So it's, it's just important that you realize that your best is good enough. Well, the holidays are hard for some because they've lost loved ones around this time of year. I know um, I lost my dad five years ago in December, and my mother, you know, I moved her here, and, you know, we're aware. That time of year, you're always aware. You know, this is when I lost my husband or my dad. So, you know, how, do pe how can people, what can people do to help them um, not stave off grief, but move through the grief that may be more acute right now? You know, that's it's a difficult time of year. It's never a good time to lose a loved one, but I also have lost a couple loved ones around Thanksgiving. And what I found myself doing last week was thinking about them and celebrating them. You know, that, that holiday, while they weren't able to sit at my table, I was still able to honor them and remember them and talk about some of the good times that we had. I also think it's a really great idea to remember what those who have gone before us would want us to do. I don't think that many of them would want us to be sad and to be missing them so extremely much. So that's one way that you can, you know, you can kind of cope with that. You can think about what they would want and do something to honor them. If it was, if your grandmother enjoyed drinking hot cocoa, make some hot cocoa. Take some time and do something special in her honor. Mm -hmm. If your dad liked to go look at holiday lights, I know my mom loves to, fortunately I still have her, but I do that every year in her honor. I live four and a half hours away from her. Mm -hmm. And so we make an effort and go look at holiday lights and think about our families and our loved ones. That sounds wonderful. Uh, but Jeff, there are some people who maybe don't have other loved ones around right. them. And they, they feel more alone. So is that a different battle altogether? Yeah, it, it really is. And when we talk about uh, individuals who are, are more isolated this time of year, mm -hmm. certainly that amplifies uh, the stressors and, and maybe that anxiety and, and the, the holiday blues that we call. Uh, I think it's important to reach out with people, and even if we can't be together, you know, a phone call. Uh, frankly, uh, one of the things that I have a, a friend who, uh, back during COVID, uh, moved back into writing letters and found that to be yeah. really something that was uh, meaningful for him. He was able to take time, write friends, write family, even though he wasn't going to be around them. It's finding different ways to kind of reach out and to, to feel connected. and. 
we have a lot of technology today that we mm -hmm. can use. You know, we have Zoom. We have the ability to do calls with our cell phone and, and be able to see people and talk to them. But let's think about that. And for those that don't have family that we're around, maybe through our churches or other organizations that we just know in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. it's a great time to reach out. Maybe uh, uh, if, if you have the time, take some cookies by find people and, and just take the time to talk. And I think the individuals will find that that's really meaningful for them also during the holidays. So what about the fact that you have someone in your neighborhood you may not know that well, but you know they're kind of, you never see anyone over at their house, or you rarely see them outside. Um, in this day and age, is it still apropos, um, either one of you, I guess, Megan, to kind of do what Jeff said, take cookies over, do something. 100%, and I'm the perfect example of that. We live in a neighborhood, and we didn't, when we moved in, I asked Jason if he knew anyone there, and he said, I wave at them. And so I walked over across the street, and I went, <laughs> Hello, I'm your new neighbor. I'm Meg. Here are some cookies. I wanted to meet you. And we have developed that friendship. And as new people come into the neighborhood, I do the same thing. I go and I knock on their door. And if they're not receptive, they're not receptive. But so far, everybody has been very, oh, it's so nice to meet you. We're, ha we're happy to have that neighborhood focus now mm -hmm. where we have someone. Have we lost that over the years with technology? And so it seems a writing a letter or face-to-face -face encounters that are not organic, but they're intentionally done. Well, I think that's why we have to be intentional about trying to keep those connections. And mm -hmm. frankly, it's what we're about here in Oklahoma. It's funny, as I travel around the country, and if I go into a convenience store, I, I'm, I go in, I just start having a conversation with the individual like I know them. And some people get a little scared about that. But that's <laughs> what we do here in Oklahoma. So. Stop uh, scaring the New Yorkers, it's, it's, Jeff. <laughs> that's, that's what I do. But that's part of our culture. Uh, and I think it's an important part of our culture that we don't want to lose. All right. Uh, Megan, did you have something on? I just, if you do see someone like that, I do encourage you to go knock on the door. I mean, it's the worst they're going to do is say no or not right. answer the door. Mm -hmm. so. And so I want to go, uh, just, it's sticking in my head. I told you guys I get caught in minutia, but, you know, in post-COVID, you know, if someone brings you cookies, are people gonna go thank you and then throw them in the <laughs> trash? You know, uh, it's a little different playing field, but maybe the gesture would be appreciated. I, I think, think the gesture, if nothing else, if you're, if you're worried, they'll throw those away, yeah. run down the street and buy some buy for them. Some. That's a good idea. I wanna talk about anxiety and people sure. do have social anxiety and the holidays, you know, you've got work parties and friends and family, especially that big family get together. Um, what's a good way for someone to prep if they really suffer, they suffer from social anxiety and don't want to be out? Jeff, I'll let you take that one. Well, I think number one, you're going to set some boundaries for yourself as mm -hmm. you go through it and become comfortable with what it is and, and what you're going to do, setting those times, what's going to happen. And, and does it work within our schedule? You know, we're pulled a lot of different directions. Mm -hmm. And so I have my wife's family, uh, my family. We have our brothers and sisters and, and their families. We have our kids now who are grown and have their own families. And, and you know, it's, everybody's always pushing back and forth. And, and it's about, oh, we have to be here at this time. It's like, no, yeah, it's, I, I learned uh, a long time ago not to worry about that uh, because it was. It was an added stressor that was really making our holidays miserable. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I just go ahead and set the boundaries. Now, are people upset sometimes if you can't make it there? Yeah, that's a, but that's okay. And I, they'll get over it and, and we'll talk about it. Do they but though? I think, I, I think they do. And I think <laughs> especially if you talk to people up front, have very frank discussions. It's like, I can't do this. This is what I'm doing or this is what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly, you know, with the, if, if you're withdrawn, but that's a good point to talk about too. If, if you have anxiety to a point that um, it is really causing you to change what your, is going on in your life and how you live your life, then it might also be a good time to reach out and talk to somebody about that mm -hmm. because there are things that we can do to help, help through those situations and, and help give people uh, the, the coping skills uh, to kind of manage that. That kind of takes me to where I want to go next, Megan, I want to turn to you when we talk about suicide prevention. Um, it can be really dark for some people. We've talked about the lighter side of stresses, but this can be really dark for some. Do you see an increase in people reaching out for help or calling suicide prevention lines during this time of year, first of all? Well, as you probably know, Oklahoma has a new uh, phone number for mental health crisis, 988. Um, we have seen in the past several months since 988 went live on July 5th, we've seen just an increase in the number of calls we're getting every month. Mm -hmm. So it'll be interesting to see what does happen this year. I do think more people are reaching out. 
um, especially to 988. You don't have to be in crisis to call. As Jeff was talking about finding some of those coping strategies, if you know now that you are a person who has anxiety around the holidays and things are ramping up, you can call and talk to a trained professional and you can get some of those coping skills and some ideas for how maybe you can handle that stress. Okay, girl, let's talk. Yes. How many times can you call that line? As Is there a limit? As many times as you want. You can call, you can text, you can, I believe, even chat online. It is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Wow. I know uh, uh, some problems is like folks, they don't have insurance. And if they don't have insurance, they cannot afford a therapist, much less um, doctoral psychiatric care. Mm -hmm. Is there any help out there for them? Actually, 988 is the perfect place to start. Regardless of your ability to pay, Oklahoma has a statewide uh, treatment network where we're, we're able to provide resources and links to services uh, regardless of that ability to pay. Mm -hmm. you know, most of our, the people within our, our network also do take insurance. Uh, we can also refer to others when, when that's more appropriate. Uh, but we have access to that. And when you look at the 988 calls that we're, we're seeing, I think within the first month, probably over 50% of those were calls related to self-harm suicide ideation. Yeah. Um, but just looking at the last month's numbers, uh, and I've, I've been talking about this around the state, uh, about 26% of the calls were self-harm. And we saw a real increase wow. in people who were ca calling about uh, navigating different types of treatment services, about social issues such as housing, about food insecurity. And so it is a resource for that. And we work with others around the state. So we work with 211 and we work with 911 systems. What is 211? 211 is uh, more for information, social services that social has been services, around forever. Okay. But call 988 and we're able to link you to whatever that service might be. We don't try to define what the, the situation needs to be for when you call. We just want people reaching out. And mm -hmm. most of the, the time what's happening is we're able to deal with that when they they have that initial call and they're talking to that professional on the other end of the line we're able to deal with those issues there but when we need to we can do more we can link people directly to treatment services if that's what they need we even have mobile services for children and adults where we can go out to a home wow. uh, out that's into beautiful. the community and respond and and make everything better Megan, what kind of help can folks expect to, what, what, what organizations are out there? We hear so much about a lack of mental health care in our state. Are there enough resources out there and what can people expect? to be the direction they go, sorry. Absolutely, no, um, there are lots of resources out there. However, I would always say that we can always use more and that is something that we are working on building is additional. Uh, throughout the state, there are uh, multiple mental health centers where people can get help at absolutely no charge. Um, it just depends on where you're at, some of, on where you're located, which one you're going to go to. Uh, Northeast Oklahoma, we've got Grand Lake Mental Health mm -hmm. over in Tulsa Family and Children's, Oklahoma city area we have um, North Care, Red Rock, all sorts of different areas like that. We've got them down in Altus. All over the state there are these these regional centers where people can go and they can get help um, if they have private insurance and their insurance will pay for them to go to a private provider we can help link them with one of those as well. Okay. So it's it's kind of all about what's right for you. Yeah. And 988 is, 8 -8 is the resource for, for finding that or okay. you can actually visit our website odmhsas.org and on that front page of the website, we have a treatment locator. You can find a variety of services in your area. Just pop in a zip code and, and it will show you on a map. Okay. I want to end. Our, our time is winding down, but I do want to make sure we get some signs out there. What are signs that you can spot in someone during the holidays or any time of year that they might be struggling? Um, one of the first things to look for is is some how is someone acting? Have they had a major change in their behavior? Mm -hmm. So if they're someone who is very outgoing and they like to talk to people, do they suddenly want to stay home and they don't want to leave the house? You know, how, how are we feeling about that? Mm -hmm. um, look for patterns in sleep behavior. If someone is starting to sleep a whole lot more or if someone is starting to not sleep at all, that can be an indicator. Mm -hmm. um, as far as suicidality, if someone starts talking about feeling completely hopeless mm -hmm. or feeling like saying things like I just don't I just don't know that I want to live through this I'm not going to make it to see another day mm -hmm. anything like that is a red flag and you need to ask them how they're doing 
are you okay? Mm -hmm. Are you considering hurting yourself? One of the common myths that's out there is if I were to say to Jeff, hey Jeff, are you considering hurting yourself? Are you thinking about suicide? Mm -hmm. A lot of folks think, and I used to believe this myself, that by asking someone that, I'm putting that idea in their head. Mm -hmm. That is not true. If they are considering suicide or they're considering self-harm, that idea already is there. Me asking that question is just helping them know, hey, I care. Mm -hmm. and I want to be able to get you some help. You, you need to be alive. You, the world needs you. That is so great. The world does need you and um, what you have to offer to everyone in your community. All right. I'd like to thank both of you for your time and for your insights. It was a, it was a fun look at how to set boundaries on the lighter side and very important information for those who are really struggling. Thank both of you. Thanks thank a you. lot. Rich.